Uh, all right. Hi. Uh, evening. I see we have uh, eight people in the room. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know if the others are going to be joining us anytime soon. Um, but uh, maybe we can just start with a recap to try and find out if... Uh, I, I don't know how many of you had a chance to go through um, what we discussed yesterday. Uh, so I, I, I don't know if people have specific questions with regards to what we looked at. Uh, so I'm just going to beam up the the slides and then just go to the slide where we have, um, I guess, a recap of what we did yesterday. Uh, sorry, I'm late, by the way. I was transitioning from another interaction, which is always the case. Uh, okay, so I just quickly go to the recap. Another recap here. Okay, uh, so I, I don't know if people have any specific questions with regards to what we did yesterday. So we 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 did quite a bit. Uh, I guess we set the stage for for really broad definition of what digital libraries are all about. And uh, I guess everyone has, by now, everyone is aware of why these things are calling digital library management systems um, around, what their purpose is, right? Uh, hopefully, we're able to distinguish between digital libraries and digital library systems and digital library management systems. Although we did mention that, uh, that, that really, uh, there's a thin line between so-called digital library systems and digital library management systems, right? Could be one and the same thing. And then we also, we wrapped up by looking at uh, some, some really broad or generic application domains for these things we're calling digital library management systems. So uh, we may mention the fact that, that uh, um, the higher education sector, for instance, who will make use of the platforms that are referred to as uh, institutional repositories, um, these organizations that are interested in setting up heritage collections or typically set up cultural heritage collections, right? Um, these are all subclusters or subcategories of these things we're calling digital libraries. And, and we also looked at some, some things that we classified as being like unconventional types of digital libraries, right? So, uh, we looked at uh, the Wayback Machine, so archive.org. Uh, we pointed at platforms like YouTube and uh, Wikicommons, for instance. Um, hopefully, uh, we are on the same page, unless if people have specific questions before we we proceed with the next unit. No. Okay. Is the key clear? We something. Yes. I was saying, I think we are on the same page. Oh, okay. All right. I, I thought you said you had a question. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Like, uh, yeah. Dr. P. Right, yes. I would uh, appreciate if you went through a bit just on content management systems. Okay. Okay, sure, not a problem. So this, this idea of uh, content management systems or CMSs is centered around um, a couple of things that are tied to two key things we discussed with Dr. Pio, two key, two key things that are associated with uh, uh, what I feel um, are, are really, what's the word again? I guess we can say formative modules. Uh, so, the idea behind the content management system is that you can dynamically generate content that is stored in a uh, typically a relational database management system, right? Um, so I'll just quickly go back here. So okay. first thing is the things we are calling content management systems or CMSs are fundamentally web-based applications, right? And because they are web-based applications, we know that uh, we expect them to have some sort of interface, 
right, which is this thing here. An interface that is typically implemented using a markup language like HTML, right? Now, historically or traditionally in the past, the, the HTML or the, the part of this web-based application that end users would use to interact with the application was static. Right, so it would be implemented using uh, those HTML tags that we were introduced to. Uh, um, like if you want to make something bold, for instance, if you want it to be in italic, if you want it to, to be rendered in such a way that it represents heading one, heading two, heading three, that stuff has traditionally been uh, static, right? Static in that you, you ha hard code the content uh, within the HTML pages, right? So you combine those HTML tags and the actual specific content to render what you want to render, right? But because, um, because the technology has evolved over time, um, people have come up with techniques to automatically generate content on the fly. So as people are interacting with an application, so for instance, if we go to the Unza website, I type in www.unza.zm, what you'll notice when you go to www.unza.zm is that there's, there's, there's portions of this, uh, I'm just gonna do this, maybe this, this will make sense, I don't know. But there's portions of this web, this in the, the homepage, the, there's portions of this homepage that change periodically. I would like to draw attention to this, for instance, Ooh, this part here, the announcements, right? and I can't highlight the announcements, I'm wondering why here. But the, the announcements will change. Tomorrow it might change if, if the UNSA decides to come up with new announcements, right? Now, in an ideal case, so traditionally what, what people would have had to do is someone would be employed and they would have to write that HTML page, they would have to, to, write, to, to create an HTML page that would be able to render this content here. If this was like published today, for instance. Uh, right, and so you, you literally see here that this corresponds to, I don't know if people can see here, but uh, if, if I can just, just give me a second, let me just reduce the, uh, just reduce the, let me zoom out, or just zoom in, easier. Right. So, so what I mean is uh, someone would have had to write this stuff here. If you look at this, this is nothing more what you see on the Unza homepage. And you think this is familiar territory now. These are all just HTML tags, right? Within the HTML tags, you have content embedded within them, right? So if you look at this, this short course thing here is embedded within a span, a span tag, right? Now, instead of, instead of you manually doing this over and over again, because these applications have evolved such that um, they periodically need to be updated, right? Uh, if you look at a large site like the Unza website, for instance, there are different portions on, on this site here. There are portions that are specific to the different schools that we have, uh, uh, portions or sections of the website that are linked to the library, for instance. Um, and, and so it would, it's, it's not sustainable to, to actually uh, create static or to use static web pages for you to render this content, although you can. And so this is where content management systems come into play. And the idea behind them is that what you do is instead of hard coding or writing these things manually from scratch, you just insert these details into the database. And then every time an end user accesses a particular portion of the website, um, the content that is associated with that part of the website is automatically extracted from the database, right? So there's dynamic content that is, um, that is pulled from the database, right? So fundamentally content management systems are database driven web applications, right? And we mentioned that uh, it turns out that because this, because content management systems or CMSs have become so useful, they are applied in so many different domains. We have generic ones, right? The generic ones are the ones that will typically be used for implementing your typical website, right? So for instance, um, think of any major, I, I guess I don't know if you can call it organization um, in Zambia or government government entity, for instance, they use content management systems. And, and in fact, we can maybe do some short exercise here, just quickly. Uh, we'll start with the most 
familiar ones, right? Uh, State House. State House Zambia website. Uh, last time I checked, this was run using uh, Joomla, I think, right? Uh, so this, this is, uh, and we know why. Oh, it's Drupal, sorry. And we know why. It's because these, most of these government-run websites are actually overseen by um, the so-called Smart Zambia Institute. And what they decided to do is to adopt, um, to adopt Drupal as the content management system of choice, right? Um, not only that, so this is Drupal here. And, and there's really, there are nifty ways of doing this. You can check this manually by inspecting the different tags in the website, but also there are services, there are other web services on the internet out there that you can use. So if you wanted to find out the content management system used by the State House website, what we'll do is, uh, uh, detect, let me see, detect, detect, oh, detect CMS, or CMS user something. There are a number of services available at what CMS. So if you use a site like what CMS, what this service does is it allows you to type or to paste um, a URL, a website URL, like a state, a state house website, and then it's able to automatically detect, although you can do this manually, but it will detect for you what sort of content management system that particular website is using. So I hope this is still Drupal. Oh, it's WordPress, WordPress now. This is weird. They've changed WordPress. So you notice here, um, this is very strange. I'm surprised. They've changed. So this is WordPress. If you type in Lighton's uh, blog, for instance, you will notice that Lighton's blog runs WordPress as well. Uh, if you type in it's WordPress, if you type in Unza, the HTTPS, and feel free to ask questions as we are walking you through this. Uh, you'll notice that it's Drupal, right? If you type in, um, what other major website? Now, there's something interesting here. There are other organizations that have a lot of money, like I have a friend of mine, a uh, very good friend of mine, works for the Central Bank, right? Boz uses a CMS as well. But the interesting thing about the CMS that they use is not your, obviously, because the open source ones are considered a security risk, and so what these people have done is they've invested money in a commercial version of the CMS. I've forgotten the name of the CMS, um, but let's, let's hope this site will be able to detect what it is. Probably not. No, it isn't. But it's, it's, a, it's not, it's not a, an open source CMS. It's a commercial version. So they pay a lot of money. Bank of Zambia pay a lot of money for the CMS they use for this. Right? So they're generic CMSs that are typically used to implement websites or web applications. And most of these things, you can download them for free and install them yourself, right? So you have generic CMSs, and then you also have CMSs that are used in specific domains. So for instance, we looked at just a few. This is by no means comprehensive, but you looked at uh, CMSs that are typically used to implement so-called learning management systems, right? Uh, so these are web applications that are used to manage teaching and learning activities or processes. Right, so think of anything that a typical institution of higher learning or a typical uh, educational institution would, would do. Um, an LMS or a learning management system is the type of content management system that you'd want to deploy or set up. And there are a lot of them, right? This is not a comprehensive list of the different types of freely available software tools that you can use to implement uh, your typical LMS. If you want, you can create one from scratch, actually, if you have the the manpower, but uh, it would be a waste of time, actually, um, right? And then we, we, we then looked at examples that are specific to what we're looking at, right? CMSs uh, that are uh, linked to digital library management systems, right? And this is going to be really the focus. This, these are meant to be the focus of, um, of this module, right? So we looked at, uh, we just highlighted a few examples, and we made mention of the fact that this, there's a lot more out there. And what type of digital library system or a CMS that is digital library specific, the type that you use is dependent on what type of application domain is going to be deployed. So if you're looking at setting up uh, a cultural heritage collection, for instance, the last thing you'd want to use is use DSpace. What you want to do is you want to use something like Omeka, for instance, or Greenstone because these tools are specifically designed for that sort of purpose. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can't use uh, Omeka or Greenstone to set up an institutional repository. You can, 
but you would need to perform a lot of customization. And we've got it to a stage where customization is trivial here because we understand the basic concepts behind markup languages, right? Specifically HTML and the underlying principles between relational database management systems. Again, a CMS, right? A CMS is nothing more than just a combination of the different concepts that we looked at. HTML, uh, we're simplifying this, but it's HTML and relational database management systems. It's dynamic content that you're dealing with, right? Uh, and the, the difference comes in how the content that is dynamically generated is going to be rendered or presented to the end users, right? Um, yeah, so I, I, hope, I hope this recap is useful. I mean, we could probably spend the, the, the entire day or the entire week really discussing content management systems, an interesting area, but that's not really the focus of our discussion. But, but it's, it's meant to set the stage for what we're talking about because it turns out that these digital library management systems are nothing more than content management systems, really. Uh, the, uh, the other way of setting apart a uh, digital library management system from, let's say, a learning management system is this whole notion of, of long-term preservation of data. Right? And this idea of long-term preservation of data is rooted in two key things, standards and metadata. Right? So you typically use standards, specific standards, to decide on things like uh, file formats that you're going to use to preserve data. Right? Uh, metadata schemes that you are going to use to facilitate the long-term preservation of, of the digital objects. I, I hope that's a, that, that's a good enough recap. Yes, thank you so much, because uh, I just wanted to find out actually what the relationship was between content management systems and digital libraries. Yeah, that's where my, ah, my right. focus so, was, but at least now I've understood how they are linked together. That's what okay. I was okay. Yeah. okay, thanks. All right, so if there are no further questions, then I suppose we will uh, we'll then transition to today's talk. And, and like I said yesterday, I, I, I was looking at the, I don't know if people uh, managed to play back the, um, managed to play back the, um, the recording that I shared. Uh, but I was looking at it, and I, I think we spent a good what two and a half hours. But but the two and a half I mean, the two and a half hours we had a, a number of discussions, which which is to be expected actually. Um, but like I said yesterday, I think it's likely that we're going to split up um, today's uh, discussion into two, which means that we need to to include Sunday to our interaction. Uh, so I think someone wants to get in. Just check. Yes. Okay, there we go. Okay, so today we we, begin, we, we look at unit, uh, we're calling this unit 6.2, which is fundamental concepts really. So the, the idea behind uh, our discussion today is to, to look at, at these core principles that, that are linked or associated to digital libraries. Um, and implicitly what we'll be looking at really is looking at aspects that, that make these CMSs we are calling digital libraries unique uh, when compared to these other generic um, or these other types of content management systems, if you will. Uh, so this is the outline of uh, the discussion. We're just going to look at uh, so-called unique identifiers, uh, metadata, um, and then interoper interoperability protocols uh, are going to be combined together with international standards. And what you immediately notice is that uh, our discussion actually has a few case studies. So our discussion of the Dublin Core metadata scheme is tied to metadata. We cannot discuss all the potential different types of metadata schemes that can be associated with digital libraries. And so we, we generally just focus on one case study. Uh, so in terms of digital libraries, we normally look at Dublin Core just because it's one of the most widely used metadata schemes. And then for the so-called interoperability protocols, we focus on the uh, so-called um, Open Access Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting, right? So the OIPMH protocol. Um, just because it's one of those protocols that you typically find in all of these different types of digital library software tools, right? And you understand why very, very soon. Okay. Um, so we, we already uh, started our discussion of unique identifiers yesterday, I guess, but today I guess we'll just go a step further to try and uh, 
consolidate what we started discussing yesterday. But just to remind us that uh, the key things associated with digital libraries um, are tied to the functionality that we'd be interested in when we set up a digital library system or a digital library management system. And specifically what digital library management systems do is they store or preserve digital objects over a long period of time. They are used to manage the digital objects that are stored within them. And more importantly, they facilitate effective access to the digital objects. Right, so three key functions associated with digital libraries. Um, and, and really these, these, these three key functions we discovered can be mapped onto um, the different layers associated to digital libraries. So yesterday we introduced the so-called user layer, right? Which is the top part, I think someone wants to come in, uh, which is this top part here, right? And this part here is what is linked to access, right? And we mentioned yesterday that this whole notion of access can be either machine to machine where you have uh, a service or a, a service, an external service, or a third party service that accesses the content in the digital library itself. Um, and then the user interaction is uh, the interaction that takes place when uh, a human being, right? An end user such as myself or yourselves gets to access a digital object from the digital library itself. Um, and then the management of the digital objects is obviously facilitated by the services, right? So introduce notion of the service layer. Um, and then finally, um, storage is typically associated with the storage layer, right? And we emphasize the fact yesterday that this storage can be viewed from two, two different angles. The storage of so-called bit streams, which is the actual content that end users would be interested in consuming and the storage of the metadata, which is nothing more than auxiliary information or descriptive information about the digital object. Otherwise called a data about data. They always say, oh, what is metadata? It's data about data, right? So it's, this is information or textual information that provides additional contextual information about the digital object. Because just providing a PDF um, just in isolation doesn't really provide you with a lot of information. Yeah, sure, yes, you might be able to consider the content, but you'd be interested in additional information like what sort of copyright is associated with the object, for instance, you know, um, things of that nature. Uh, so if your microphone is on, maybe you switch it off. All right, so so this, this whole idea of unique identifiers really turns out is not unique to these things we're calling digital libraries, right? Um, there are a number of use cases or scenarios where we tend to use unique identifiers. So we have, uh, I'm not sure who has the microphone on, but uh, maybe we, I don't know if it was Mr. Zulu here who was, uh, but, um, <clears throat> right, so, it turns out that unique identifiers are all over, right? Uh, insofar as MTN is concerned, your your MSI SDN number or your so-called phone number is your unique identifier on their network, right? Uh, and in fact, it could be viewed as your unique identifier as the mobile user in Zambia, right? Because that number is unique to is unique to you, right? In fact, if you think about it, if you use the actual fully qualified MSI SDN or the phone number itself that phone number that you use is unique to you in the whole world, right? The part that has the plus two six signals the fact that that particular number is coming from Zambia, for instance, right? Uh, plus two six zero, like in the case of Lighton, plus two six zero nine seven seven two zero one two two eight, for instance, right? So unique identifiers all over the place, phone numbers, email addresses, right? It's, it's a way um, of uniquely setting an entity apart from the others, right? Passport numbers, for instance, things like your NRC. Granted, things like your NRC only provide like local, local uniqueness, right? I'm not sure if that number is uh, unique in the whole world. Uh, maybe, maybe not, but, but, but set me a passport, right? Um, and it turns out that uh, digital library objects need to be set apart from the other objects, right? Um, when compared with other 
other objects in the collection within which that object is. And in fact, when compared with other objects out there on the internet. Because remember, fundamentally, one of the things that you will end up doing once you set up this so-called digital library is you will provide access to the content in that digital library via the internet. Um, and so once you do that, you need a way of setting apart the objects that are in your repository from other objects out there. And this is where identifiers come in. Um, and really, if you think about it, uh, they, they play a crucial role of facilitating effective discovery of digital objects. Because using that identifier, you can easily say, I want to log in, or I want to access this particular object in the UNSA repository, right? So you'd be using an identifier to access the, the specific digital object that you're looking for. Uh, granted, you wouldn't really be, you'd, you'd be doing this implicitly, maybe using some, some, some service that is integrated within the repository itself, right? Or within the digital library system itself. Um, so a few things in terms of the characteristics associated with uh, unique identifiers tied to digital objects here is that uh, uh, they, they should be used to uniquely name the digital object and digital object metadata, right? Um, and another key trait here is they should provide local and global uniqueness. Uh, so using that identifier, you should be able to uniquely identify the object within the, the digital library itself and also um, within a particular network like the internet, for instance, right? So it should provide global and local uniqueness. Um, and another key thing here is that the identifier should, should use some sort of um, naming scheme uh, that is consistent, right? And a, a key thing uh, for most of these identifiers that are available out there, like DOIs, for instance, or handles is within the code itself, within the identifier, you'll find uh, portions of the identifier that will uniquely identify your repository, portions of the identifier that will uniquely identify the object when referred to in that particular digital library or repository, right? The key thing here, there should be some sort of consistent naming convention. I'm just gonna pause here and uh, just maybe try and rub it in by going to the UNSA institutional repository so that people understand what we're talking about here. We're talking about, uh, uh, we're referring to things like uh, global unique, about, sorry, uh, naming convention here. Um, so if I, if I go to the thesis and dissertation collection, for instance, what you immediately notice once we start sitting through these, once we start sitting through these, um, these, uh, these objects here is that if you view the metadata and actually I'll say show full metadata record. If you view the metadata and you focus on this thing we are calling the, the identifier, this dc.identifier.uri for instance. I'm just gonna copy this. This is object number one, right? Um, what you immediately notice is that there's a consistent pattern. That's the first object. If I go to some other random object here, come here and view the full item record and copy this, you can easily see that there's some sort of pattern here, right? Um, the only part that's different is the last bit after the last final forward slash, right? And uh, just for your information, this code here, this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is what, uh, uh, by default, this is the UNSA repository's ID then this ID here is the ID that is, uh, that uniquely identifies this particular digital object, right? And uh, for those wondering why one, two, three, all the way up to nine is used here, it turns out that the way this space works by default is that um, if, you, if you haven't integrated your institutional repository with uh, a handle server or a DOI server, by default, this is a string that will be used. Uh, if on the other hand, you flip this and you go to a repository that is integrated with an actual handle server and will go to our very own uh, UCT repository, what you will notice is that when you access a digital object, their ID, they're using this space, but the, the repository ID is unique relative to the, uh, to the type of identifier that they're using. In this case, it's handles, right? 
So this is what I'm referring to here. If I copy this, so insofar as the UCP repository is concerned, uh, from the outside world, their repository is uniquely identified using this code here. Right, so I hope that makes sense. A key, a key thing, a key things here to take away here is the, the characteristics of unique identifier. It should be able to provide local and global uniqueness, right? It should be able to uniquely identify or uniquely name the digital objects, right? The metadata associated with the digital object, obviously. Um, although this is not, although this is not a, a mandatory requirement, but it should optionally use some sort of consistent naming scheme. Um, all right, so it turns out that there are a number of, um, a number of uh, uh, naming schemes or identification schemes that you can use to uniquely identify your objects out there. And some common ones that perhaps most people have come across here is, uh, I'd like to think everybody attending this class today has come across so-called DOIs, right? When you're doing your literature review and you go on Google Scholar, you probably come across um, some literature that you're interested in and it will typically be associated with a DOI, right? The DOI simply stands for digital object identifier, right? So it's one, one way of you uniquely identifying digital objects in your repository or in your digital library. Um, another co common way of doing this is by using so-called handles, right? Uh, there are also um, naming schemes that are referred to as the pure URLs, for instance. Um, uh, or if you want, if you are cash strapped, you can do what UNSA has decided to do. The UNSA institutional repository does not make use of DOIs or handles. The reason is, uh, it turns out that, um, I don't know if this is the reason why UNSA doesn't, uh, has not integrated the repository with handles or DOIs, but it turns out that for you to be able to use DOIs with your repository, you need to make a subscription. You need to pay money for this. And the payment of money is actually relative to how much content you have in your repository or in your digital library, for instance, right? Um, but what the ones have decided to do is they're not using handles, right? They've decided instead to use just a, just a URI. This is a normal URI here, a generic URI. Right? If you think about it, you compare this with the UCT repository, you notice that we, we, this, this, this thing here, this object is coming from the UCT repository, but you, what you immediately notice is that, but wait a minute, why is it that the host name for this particular object is not, is not linked to UCT, right? It turns out that one, 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 of, the, one of the reasons why you might want to integrate, um, might want to integrate uh, a handle server or DOI server with your repository is name resolution. In its current form, um, the UNSA repository, the way it's set up is, is such that if we decided to say, we want to change the name of our repository from dspace.unsa.zm to something else, uh, because dspace is generic, maybe we want to, to name this ir.unsa.zm. What we would have to do is rename all the digital objects that we have in the repository. I don't know if this is making sense. But when you are using um, a service such as the handle service here, it automatically resolves to this DOI such that if you change the name of your, uh, of your repository, for instance, of the server where the repository is currently housed, uh, all you have to do is just uh, inform the people that are responsible for this or just change the configuration so that um, the handle server points to the newly set up uh, repository name or something, right? And, and observe, if, if you open an incognito window here and say, uh, okay, I'm going to type this in and access this, this content here, right? Uh, you notice that the host name here is handle.net, but once I press enter, it automatically resolves. I don't know if you can see the address bar here. It, it has automatically resolved to this thing here. So, so effectively, what, what, what this points to is this, right? So I, I don't know if this idea of um, 
uh, using these, these sort of naming schemes like pure URLs and, and DOIs and, and handles makes sense here. Uh, usually people will be a bit skeptical. Why should I, why should I be, why should I be, why should we be spending money as an organization? Um, you know, subscribing to, subscribing to, oh, more people are coming in, subscribing to the to a handle service, for instance, a DOI service, because it's more money for your organization, right? Well, you want to make sure that uh, uh, name resolution is seamless. Now, again, if this is not making sense, um, I know I'm waffling around, but I'm trying to make sure that this makes sense here. I'm going to go to uh, a portal that I introduced us to yesterday, the so-called OATD. And I want us to do a simple experiment to show you what's, or, or why it's extremely important for you to think long and hard as an organization, think long and hard about subscribing to these services, right? So if we go to OAITD, for instance, right? And we search for UNSA. I hope this, this will work. It always works, OATD. Remember I said this is nothing more than a downstream service and you automatically harvest content from repositories around the world, right? And by the way, you can uh, view these different repositories around the world by going to, um, uh, you notice here that they're pulling these resources from around 1,100 colleges and universities, right? There's a comprehensive list there. And these people are indexing a total of 5 million uh, electronic theses and dissertations from around the world. Uh, this is where they're coming from here, right? So the people are interested in looking at this afterwards. Oh, uh, can you not hear me? I see Constance is saying I can't hear you. I need to pause here. Can, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you myself. Oh, Betson. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so, uh, Madam, if I probably want to. Okay, great, thanks. All right, so observe, right? If I if I go to this to this portal and I say I want to search for content coming in from the University of Zambia, right? What you immediately notice is that the way these these downstream services work is that due to copyright issues, what they do is they do they only have this metadata. Right? Remember, a digital object is made up of um, met metadata and uh, uh, actual bit streams, right? So observe, uh, and this is uh, this is probably this is a bad. Well, this is a classic example. Look at this, right? Uh, if you look at okay, if you look at this this ET, this etd here. That's coming from Mirenda Polos, right? I don't know if you can see this, this object here. This object is coming from the OATD portal. But the way the OATD portal works is they only have this metadata. So for people that are interested in consuming the PDF from the UNSA repository, they would have to click this link here. This link is ideally supposed to take you to the UNSA repository. But notice what happens when I click this link. When I click it, it will probably be a dead link, right? It's a dead link because there are certain assumptions that are being made by this downstream service, this OATD. They assume that the repositories where they are pulling this information from have actually done the correct things. So one of the things you want to do is to make sure that you are using the correct sort of like uh, uh, unique identifiers or something. In an ideal case, this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine was supposed to map onto an, an actual globally identifiable repository. Observe what happens when you search for the University of Cape Town, right? We know that the University of Cape Town and obviously Stellenbosch and, and the University of Pretoria, these have actually done the, the, the correct thing. So uh, if we just wait for it and wait for the results, I'll show you exactly what this uh, this is all about. I hope this is making sense. And uh, by the way, these things here, um, it turns out that they transcend so many different areas. So if you work for uh, a higher education institution, as we wait for this to load, I don't know why it's taking time, the platform is slow. If you're thinking of setting up so-called um, electronic journals, right? Like, like we've done at the University of Zambia, for instance. One of the things you'd have to think about, right, is when I see this has somewhat changed slightly, this is good. One of the, one of the things you, you soon realize is that you would have, you would have to, 
you would have to oh this is weird I, I didn't know this this portal was like this it has changed significantly wow okay yeah they've changed the interface one of the things you would have to do here is you'd have to, to think beyond because when you have you when you integrate your portal with uh, these these entities that are or these things that are sort of like um, globally recognized, there's some sort of authenticity associated with what you're doing, right? So if only I could find uh, I think they've changed the interface significantly here, which is weird here. I was trying to access the other journals, but but ideally you one of the things you'd want to do when you set up a journal, maybe we'll go to Zagreus actually, because it's isolated. Uh, this is the, by the way, this Zajlis is um, um, it's a homegrown journal. This is a journal for the, our department. So I think of publishing, please think of doing that. But, but for me to add some sort of um, credibility to what you're doing, you want to avoid what we are doing as Zajlis, right? The unique identifier that we're using is a normal URI, right? Observe this thing here. This is bad. It's not really that bad, but it, it really, in terms of credibility, like when, I'm, when you're looking for content, obviously some sort of authenticity associated with things like something that has a DOI, for instance, right? Uh, what you want to do is to mimic what the so-called Zambia ICT journal does, where um, they pay a subscription, and so each, each object in, in, in this journal itself uh, is associated with a DOI, right? So this is what we're talking about here, if we come here, this thing here. This, right, um, and you immediately notice here, right, that that I don't know if you can see this, but this article that I'm accessing right now is associated with two links. There's an original link that is associated with the actual um, host name of the journal itself, which is ictjournal.icict.org.zm, and then there's there's a there's a unique identifier that is that provides some sort of, uh, that, that is that points to this DOI uh, naming service, right? Uh, and the beauty of this DOI naming service, like I said, is in the event that these people decide to change this name here, it won't affect this URL. People will still be able to go to the newly, uh, newly defined name for this John, right? So I, I don't know if this is all making sense, but uh, global uniqueness, yes, but also these naming services that are available and, and really, um, we just, we, we're mentioning DOIs here and handles because these are some of the most widely used. Your typical repository, by the way, will normally be associated with handles. Most of them will use the handle service. A few will, will, will go with DOIs. And in fact, traditionally platforms like Dispace have mostly um, made it a lot easier for you to integrate uh, the handle server with the Dispace, right? So if you, if you, if you just Google up handle, handle server, this space, there's a whole uh, portion of the this uh, documentation that talks about how you get to, to integrate uh, the handle service. And if only I could find the thing, but anyway, a story for another time here. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so hope this whole notion of unique identifiers makes sense here. Um, Again, most of these things I've already spoken about. One of the reasons why you'd, you'd want to use um, um, these name resolutions like handles and DOIs is because they're location independent. So in the event that your domain name changes, it won't affect the handle URL, right? This, this thing remains persistent. Uh, and your typical handle or DOI will have a component that identifies a repository uniquely, right? and the component that identifies, so this is a repository ID, and then this would be the digital object. This is the ID for the object itself that you're interested in. Um, and you can see this really by accessing, if, if you go to the actual name resolution service, like the doi.org, I guess, I don't know if it's doi.org, HTTPS, if you go here, 
You can actually use, you can actually, they have a service that allows you to search. I do hope you can, we can easily search for a resource. Let's see if we can, there used to be a service. I'm wondering why it's not there anymore. But maybe I, uh, hmm. Okay, so there we go, right? If you, if you look at this, if I just submit, uh, I'm just gonna do this. If I copy this, this bit here, and just paste it into this, uh, this text box here, I should be redirected to the resource that I'm looking for. Which is a beauty, really. Uh, so this is going to also be obvious, which makes sense, right? Um, so boom, right? All right, uh, so I hope this makes sense, right? Um, location independence. Uh, and, and the location independence allows you to actually resolve to uh, which repository actually holds that, that ID. Now you, you have to, this, we, we should pause here and think about what's happening here. In as much as this ID associated with the repository will be unique, the last bit here that identifies the object might not be unique, right? So somebody else out there might come up with a similar naming scheme as our repository. And this is extremely common for this space um, repositories. Why? Because the people that set them up uh, use default values. So if you look at uh, UCT, UP, uh, Stanford, UNSA, what you will immediately notice is that all of these entities, if you look at the last bit that identifies, or that's supposed to identify the, the object, all of them are using just a serial number that increments, right? 32098. This is just a number that automatically increments, right? 6154. So if you, if you just say the object that we have in the user repository is 6154, this, this number here, while, while it provides local uniqueness, it will not provide global uniqueness because there's likely another repository out there that uses this same ID to identify um, an object in that repository. And true to that, if we go to UCT, this is coming from UNSA, right? As far as UNSA is concerned, there's an object that has this ID here, right? because this is a repository, this is the object ID. But if we go to another random repository, let's say the UCT repository, for instance, what you notice is that we'll be able to find a digital object that uses that same ID. I'm just uh, going to make this a lot easier so that I access uh, a resource here, boom. If you, if you notice this resource that I'm accessing here, so as an example, my thesis is this, if I replace, if I replace the UNSA object from the user ID, the 6154, uh, to check which object in the UCT repository is linked to that ID. What you'll notice is there is another, there's an object in the UCT repository that uses the same ID as, as an object in the user repository. So using, the key takeaway point here is that using just the ID of the object itself is not enough to provide global uniqueness. It is enough to provide local uniqueness within the confines of the repository, um, but for you to, to be able to globally identify it or set it apart from other objects on the internet, you, you need some sort of uh, naming scheme, right? The URI, URI is really tied to these handles or DOIs, right? Um, okay. I hope that makes sense. Uh, so some random examples here. I think this is familiar territory. Most of us have actually come across this. These are all over actually. These things we're calling DOIs and handles. If you've been paying attention as you're accessing or consuming content, you realize that these are all over. Um, some, some naming schemes are quite popular like DOIs and handles. Some of them are a bit obscure like pure URLs for instance, so you rarely come across them. Um, some of them are specific to certain portals. So for instance, if you go to archive.org, Right. What you notice is archive.org. I don't know if these guys are, um, are not the archive I'm talking about, this archive.org, archive.org. This is a, the other archive I'm talking about, this repository that houses um, uh, a preprint from, from STEM-centric fields, right? So physics, chemistry, computer science, biology, and whatnot. What you'll notice is if you start accessing content from here, right? By the way, if people are not familiar with Archive, I'm just going to share this with you. If you access content from Archive, what you notice is they use the, uh, their own homegrown uh, unique scheme, which this makes sense actually. 
Uh, so if we access some random content, let's say for March, for instance, and uh, go to, I don't know why I chose March here, but if we go to one of the most recent, let's see if we can find more, one of the more recent publications, I guess, new. And by the way, what I'm doing here is I'm accessing, this is archive is a digital library, so I'm, I'm browsing, I'm using the browse service, right? These are the things we discussed last time. So if you look at archive, their, their own naming, the scheme they're using is, if you look at this here, right? This, the way they identify their IDs is like so. So if I access this resource here, for instance, I don't know if they also use DOIs, probably not. But the, these archive IDs actually, they've become sort of like recognized and if you use tools like, uh, uh, I guess Deep Tech, for instance, you notice that there's a provision for you to provide an archive ID, right? So different type of ID, right? But same principle, really. Uh, I hope this makes sense. There are also things that I like, said, pure URL or something, pure URL, pure URL. I don't know if it's pure URL. I hope there's a, there's a wiki page. Wikipedia is useful these days. No. Is it P URL? Put in the naming scheme, P R U R L. P U R L. Thank you. Persistent URL. All right. Uh, I hope you'll be able to find it here. Yeah. So this is what we're looking for. Persistent inform. Yeah, so there, there's there's a whole bunch of um, of naming schemes out there. Um, and I guess part of what you'd need to do is not see the comparison here, part of what you need to do as an expert is to be able to provide uh, informative information to whoever might be interested in implementing this to say, I think what we should do as an organization is make a subscription so that we use DOIs, for instance. Perhaps DOIs would be much cheaper than handles, right? Uh, or perhaps uh, it's because DOIs um, provide you with, I guess, if you look at it subjectively, most people will, we immediately um, consider the things, the digital object in your repository to be authentic if they look at the DOI, right? Oh, this, there's a DOI associated with this resource and it must be authentic or something. It's unlikely that it's coming from a predatory drone or something. Okay. Um, so like I said, DOIs are all over the show here. I mean, just an example of uh, where you typically find um, uh, handles being used rather than DOIs. This is common for most, most of these institutional repositories. Uh, the UNSA does not use any naming scheme. This is why we have these sort of things here. This is problematic. Um, we've, we've had uh, discussions with uh, the people that man this, and I think it's work in progress that very, very soon most of these things will actually be, be sorted out. But these are things to think about, you know, if you, if you are uh, really thinking about setting up a repository. Uh, so I don't know if there are any questions before we, we start our discussion of metadata. Uh, hopefully this whole notion of unique identifiers is uh, clear and things are making sense. Okay, all right. Yes, we are following. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, uh, I guess maybe we can cruise here. I don't know, uh, most of the people in the room, I'm guessing, uh, are experts when it comes to metadata, right? Um, but we've already uh, made mention of the fact that your, your typical digital object, right, in digital libraries, could be viewed as being composed of two separate parts. So there's uh, the content, which is represented by bit stream, right? Bit stream, meaning that that content is composed of bits, right, ones and zeros. And then there's a descriptive information or data about the bit stream itself. So to provide more context about the digital object, um, because the content itself might not be uh, sufficient enough to enable someone to want to consume it. Now for certain content like a PDF, you might sit there and think, well, why would you need metadata, right? A PDF document maybe is not an unlikely candidate for where metadata is important because it's easy for someone to open it up. But Imagine a situation where you, you, you want to consume something like a video. For you to know what a video is about, 
one of the things you'd have to do is do exactly what you do to a PDF document, open it up. And for a video, you'd have to play it back. Now imagine a situation where you're searching for video content and then um, a whole range of results come up, right? Playing, playing back all the results that come up is not a sustainable way of filtering out what you're looking for. This is why you need metadata, right? Um, and we see it, uh, we see this on platforms like YouTube, right? When you're searching for content on YouTube, you rely on metadata to identify which video you want to, to play, right? And metadata elements include like the title, you look at the title, you look at the tags, you look at the location where that, um, that particular video was created from, right? These are all things that will provide more contextual information um, associated with the digital object. Now, in the event that people maybe might not really, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this yesterday or not, but in the event that people are not, uh, need me to really rub it in here. I'm going to give you an example of what I typically go through when I'm uploading videos, uh, these lecture screencasts on YouTube. I meticulously associate metadata to all of this because I know that besides the people enrolled in these courses, there are other people that might be interested in consuming this content, right? So uh, if I if I I'll open up one sample, thing here, I'll open up this thing here, right? If you look at this video here, when people are, 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 watch, are, are searching for content out there, one of the ways that they, they're able to find this small little screencast that I've created here is by relying on metadata, right? So the content they're interested in is the video, but for them to decide on whether they want to waste four minutes of their uh, life, right? To actually play back this video, they rely on metadata title, description. There are things that you, you that the behind the scenes things that you might not see, but there are tags as well. Details to do with the license, right? These are all metadata, right? And you notice that when, uh, when you're uploading content, right, on YouTube, which is a digital library we discovered, I will specify metadata, the title, description, the tags, Right? These tags here, it turns out, are really important, right? Licensing information. This is all descriptive, uh, descriptive information that provides more context about the bitstream, the actual content that users will consume. Right? Um, so it turns out that the so-called metadata really can be external, which is usually the case these days, or it can be embedded within the bitstream. Um, and, and there, there are a number of uh, these uh, digital object management operations, right? Remember the service layer of the digital library system here that will enable you to manipulate the metadata. So if I realize to say, oh, when I was creating this, when I was ingesting this digital object, I misspelled the title. I would use an operation that allows me to modify the title. So I edit the digital object metadata and change the title. Right. What I'm doing is I am manipulating the object. Specifically, I'm manipulating the metadata, right? Um, right, so really a whole broad spectrum of uh, types of metadata here. I always like using this example. If you're one of those people that takes uh, a lot of pictures, you might not know this, but most of these devices you use to take pictures, like uh, mobile devices, for instance, or these cameras. They'll behind the scenes, they, they're actually collecting a whole host of metadata about that image that you're taking, right? So this is an example of an image taken by my phone, for instance, without me explicitly indicating the metadata, what, what my phone does, or what the operating system, in this case Android does is, it keeps track of metadata to do with the phone manufacturer, for instance. Now, some of this metadata, you might sit there and think, ah, oh, it's not useful. Yes, some of it is useful, actually. The resolution of the image I've taken, the size of the image, right? If you look at the, inch, the, the size of the image here, right? the software that was used to take the image. And, and in fact, in, in certain instances, you might unknowingly not know that sensitive information like the geolocation of where the image was taken from, right? Now, this, this example doesn't have that information, but you have GPS tags, right? the date and time when that, that particular image was taken. Now, all of these things here, all of these things are metadata, right? Some of which is explicitly created, some of which is 
created by the application behind the scenes, right? Uh, and the whole point behind uh, this, this descriptive information on data about data is you want to provide more context about that image, right? Uh, some of these things might not really be useful right now, but uh, maybe they might be useful in some other applications that are used later on, right? Um, I don't know how many people use uh, Google Photos, but I use Google Photos a lot, and, and I quite like the fact that it tracks it tracks my location. So when I visit certain places, like uh, if, if I'm somewhere and I take maybe 100 or maybe 500 photos, the last thing I would want to do is for each one of those 100 photos, I see it and then I start saying, this is a title, this is a description. Now, I never do that these days. I stopped doing that. I used to do that, but I stopped doing that. But I, what I do is I rely on the geolocation tags. And so, so that when I access these photos, I know that these particular photos were taken, let's say, uh, in the South Wanga National Park on this particular day, on this year of this month. That way I can easily organize my photos. And I don't know if I'm making sense, but ideally the key takeaway point here is that the image on its own is not enough for you to provide enough information, right? Uh, you need auxiliary information by way of metadata, right? Uh, so this is external, this, this, by the way, what we're looking at is example, these are all examples of embedded metadata, right? So you'll notice that uh, I'm accessing this metadata associated with this image here by running the AXIF um, utility or software tool here. And I'm extracting this metadata from the image itself because it's embedded to the image. And we see this in, in, in really applications that we're familiar with, PDF. Uh, and this disappointing thing about uh, about uh, about PDF here is people do not realize the importance of ensuring that when you're creating a document in Microsoft Word, provide metadata. I don't know how many of you do this, but when you open a word processor, most people just open it and then you say, "Oh, I'm just going to save this. I'll save this as a as a." Oh, it's taking time. I'll save this as a, as a list example, for instance. Oh, oops, sorry about that. I'll save this as a list 5310 example metadata document. What people forget is that, um, sorry about that, I think I went to the wrong location here. Let's call it list 5310 example, example metadata. Now, I have a very funny story about metadata. I worked with uh, honor students when I was a graduate student myself. And there was this one student who used to pronounce metadata as metadata, meta, meta right? That was nice. I, I was supervising the student together with my one of my doctoral advisors. And I remember him laughing and correcting him, saying, no, it's not metadata, it's metadata, right? Not that it matters anyway. Uh, I guess pronounce it however you want to. But the thing that people miss is you randomly just save a document and then you start typing, right? You start typing and then you're done. You forget that when you export this as PDF, there's important information that will provide contextual information, which is embedded by default when you create a document. And you access this by going to File, Properties. If you don't explicitly specify the document, the metadata, you will not be able to, to have that auxiliary information. You notice that the application for me has, because I've configured it a certain way, it will, by default, it will pull information uh, that I've predefined to say the author is light on. The application creating this is writer. But what you should do, what people forget to do is that when you're creating a document, you open Microsoft Word, in this case, LibreOffice Writer, and then you explicitly supply metadata elements. Title. This thing has no title right now, right? If you notice this metadata I was accessing, properties, this PDF document. No title here. I don't know if you can see this. No title here. Because I did not explicitly specify the title in this word processor coming up here. I did not supply metadata, example, metadata type, subject. I'll just call this list 5310. Keywords, example. example. This is all important information that people take for granted. Now, now I know, right, for some people, this is, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a painful 
task, it's irrelevant, but I will show you just now that it's an important thing to do, right? You notice now if I check the property of this PDF document, I now have the title, the subject, uh, and the author, right? Um, you will soon see the importance of doing this when you're indexing content, especially when these um, so-called uh, search engines index your content. It turns out that this information is extremely important. So these are things to think about, right? Um, but key takeaway point is all these different things I'm showcasing, this is embedded metadata. This is embedded within the document itself. So it's not like there's an external file or there's a database that is that is holding the metadata itself. The metadata is embedded within the document, right? Within the content that the user is consuming. Classic example of why you might want to embed metadata when it comes to PDF documents here is you want to avoid this. These people here, these are ATDs, I think. These people never bother to create um, to create uh, explicit metadata, and so the end result is the documents that they have don't have titles there, right? So when these search engines are indexing this content, uh, you have this sort of situation. You want to avoid this so that you have this. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're sitting there and you're thinking, what, why should you bother, right? You will soon see once we discuss information retrieval that this can make a difference on whether someone will access this content or not. If I'm searching for content, right? Uh, let's say from the UNSA repository, for instance, and I want to search for it the way that the average user searches, using a search engine. I will use Google, I'll go to Google, right? Pow. And then I'll say, I'll explicitly search uh, for content from the UNSA institution repository. Um, just zoom this up. I'll just explicitly try to say I want to search from the UNSA repository, right? And then I'll say I'm interested. Now, I just want to execute out content here, PDF document. Let's say, um, I'll just enter here. Okay, let's say I'm, I'm searching for information, science. Uh, and these are all, okay, if I'm a user, right? And I search for information science, what are the odds that I will decide to choose, well, I will decide to choose this over something like this? Very high, right? Because I know that already if I just look at the title here, which is more descriptive, it provides me with more contextual information than something that just has the P171 GIFWEPA, right? This tells me nothing. I don't know if I'm making sense here. Uh, a, a small little thing that most people tend to forget, um, I, 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 pre I quite prefer myself to waste maybe one or, or two additional minutes to do this. Uh, and to showcase to you that I obsess a lot about this, by the way, is uh, I'm just going to show you an example here. I just exported this presentation slide, which is in PDF, the one I'm using right now, from Google Slides. The way Google Slides work is, by default, it ha there's no metadata here. So the, I never upload these slides without explicitly tagging the document with metadata. Now, I use the unconventional method of just injecting the metadata, um, injecting this metadata, uh, uh, I inject this metadata into a PDF file and then, so I'll show you just now. These are important things to talk about, I guess. I don't know if you are interested, but observe. Um, uh, I will copy that file. I'll copy it from uh, slides in Hunza 20, 53, 10, 25, PDF. I'll copy, I've copied this document here, right? the document, uh, I will open this document so that I have two copies. I open it up, right? So this document here has no, there's no useful metadata about this document, right? What I do before I share my documents, my PDF documents exported from either Google Docs or Google Slides is I will create, I will create, I will inject metadata, right? So I'll first of all, and just don't don't worry about the tools I'm using right now. But I'll I'll, I'll export uh, I'll export the metadata, the kind of metadata here, and I'll just say uh, output uh, uh, let's call this text. For example, example list fifty three ten. The critical point here, remember, let's not lose track of the fact that we're looking at embedded metadata. The importance of metadata, anyway, but looking at embedded metadata, this is external metadata. If I go to 
to this file that I've just created, you will notice that it doesn't have the useful information that I would want to associate this file with. So what I do is I create, I, I, I associate or I include important metadata, right, about the document. So I include details like the author. Right now, this file, if I say properties, it doesn't say who the author is. There's no item theory here. It doesn't say what the title is. Right? For someone to know what the title is of this document, you don't have to download this document, which by the way is quite large, it's 21 megabytes. You don't want people to waste data, right? You don't want to force people to download 21 megabytes, and they only to discover that that information is not what they're looking for. Um, so what I'll do is I'll associate this metadata and I'll say, uh, I want the author there to be there. The title here is, I'll change it to example list 5310 title metadata, right? Um, and then what I do then is I will use the PDF TK utility again, and then uh, just inject the metadata, right? Or I'll get the info. Um, and then I'll say example, who this 310, and then I'll say output is equal to final. I'll say this, this 5310 final, the PDF, right? And you notice that once I, I go to the location which has those files and I open, I open this document now, you notice a few things. I don't know if you can see my mouse on top here. This thing has no title, it just has the file name. This thing now has a title. This thing, when I check the metadata using the PDF view I'm using, there's no title, there's no author. But this newly created file, which is the same as what I have now, has the metadata, the embedded metadata, the author, the creator, the software that was used to, pre, to, to create this, this PDF document, when the file was created, when it was last modified, keywords associated with the file. These are all important information that the search engines will make uh, use of. And you'll soon see the importance once we discuss information retrieval systems next week. All right, uh, I'll close this. I hope um, this kind of makes sense. Again, metadata, external, this is uh, embedded, the importance of metadata, provide in context information. Uh, so it turns out that um, there are smart people out there that have figured out that uh, metadata comes in three broad categories. There's so-called descriptive metadata, structural metadata, and administrative metadata, right? The descriptive metadata is the one that provides descriptive information about the digital object. So usually the information you'd want to use insofar as searching and browsing is concerned, right? So things like the title, the author, abstract. These are all descriptive metadata elements that help people to find what they're looking for. Structural metadata helps with presentation of content. Um, I see Harriet wants to come in here. So uh, the structural metadata is helpful in, 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 in facilitating how you want to present that digital object. And this would be in your digital library. So if you look at, um, and there's an example screen, screenshot here, but if you look at the UCT repository, for instance, or the user repository, the structural metadata will help you specify the hierarchy, where you want this object, where, where the object appears. And you notice that the structure helps people navigate where exactly in the repository they want to access, right? So I want to access electronic thesis and dissertations. If I go to the home page, I will implicitly make use of structural metadata to say, oh, I'm not interested in ETDs, I'm interested in open education resources, right? So structural metadata will ensure that the digital object is presented in a certain way, right? So the rendering itself of the digital object is facilitated by structural metadata. Um, and then um, administrative metadata will typically uh, help in the management of the digital object. So all management centric activities or tasks would be linked to administrative metadata. And so this would be things associated with um, access rights associated to the object. Um, intellectual property type thing, so copyright, right? Uh, details to do with preservation, long-term preservation of the digital object, right? Um, and, and if you think about it, these things that are associated with IP or long-term preservation are not, these are things that an end user will not be interested in, if you think about it, right? And I have examples to showcase this, right? So 
Classic examples of descriptive, met descriptive metadata here, like I said, this is information that will help people find what they're looking for when they're searching and browsing or using other discovery-centric services provided by the digital library, right? So I've highlighted some example uh, descriptive met metadata elements associated with this particular digital object, right? So the advisor for this particular ETD, the author who happens to have been light on, uh, the other advisor, um, how this should be cited, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to pause for a little while. I just want to tell someone to say I'll call back later on. I'm so sorry, I apologize. Uh, uh, class, can I call you back later? Thanks. All right. Uh, sorry about that. Normally when my, I, I know, when my mother calls around this time, I should mention it was my mother, it's usually to chit chat, right? She likes chit chatting, which is quite good, I suppose. Uh, so it's polite, I suppose, when the mother's called to say, no, I'm busy, I'm not ignoring you. She, she's, I think she's getting old sometimes, you know, he doesn't pick up my phone calls, hard telling my siblings, but sorry about that. So descriptive metadata, right? Um, Usually, it facilitates um, searching and browsing, anything to do with discovery of digital objects. Structural metadata, um, how the object is going to be presented, right? Now, in this case, I'm just highlighting the stuff that you have in this breadcrumb here, the, the top part here, right? All of these provide like uh, associated to the structure of this digital object, right? So implicitly, these things here can be mapped onto so-called sets. And these sets are like container structures that specify where in the repository this object should be stored in. So using this, these IDs here, you know that uh, the content is either in this community here or in this community. If you further drill down into this community, you'll be able to discover that, oh, this, this, this particular, if I go into books here, I know that this particular resource here is under research output, but it's also a book, right? So it, it helps with presentation um, of digital objects. And you see it all over, right? If we go to the UNSA repository, same thing. It's just that the implementation is different. If you look at the UNSA repository, we have communities. So I know that because there's structural metadata that is associated with the digital objects, I can drill down to the specific content that I'm looking for. Oh, I want to see um, uh, publications maybe done by um, Adrian, I suppose, I don't know. So I'll go to the library collection. So I know that I'm, I'm filtering out just content that is published by the library, right? And I'll further drill down into a specific collection within this community that I want, right? There may be content that is produced by the main library, right? All of these things, right? When I'm navigating through this repository, I'm implicitly making use of structural metadata, right? Like the key thing here is that the structural metadata helps in the presentation of content. Um, and then administrative metadata, which is the behind the scenes stuff that we said helps in the administration of uh, or management of the digital object, right? So if I want to modify a digital object, I would have to make reference to it by using the identifier, for instance, um, anything that is linked to maybe the format that is specific to the object. A user has, uh, is not interested in this, right? If, if, I, if a user comes to the UNSA repository and they access this resource and they view the full metadata record, unless you're an expert librarian or an expert at repositories, you don't care that, you don't care that the, uh, oh, and I see this, uh, this is a bad example. This thing doesn't have the actual, horrible example, this one. It doesn't have the, the, actual, the actual type of the record. I hope this one does. If a user comes here and views a full metadata record, the user doesn't care that, I hope the application is, and that maybe that's the reason why actually, it's, it's a case for all, all of them. And this is the reason why. The user doesn't care about the application, uh, application or the format of the file. But an external application might be interested in doing that, which is why if you go here, if you access the, the metadata in a certain unique way that your average user won't be able to access, you'll be able to see administrative metadata like the format, right? So, so 
I, I, I'm accessing the format here, not using the normal conventional way that the user does when browsing. You can't see the format here. But I, when I'm accessing the entire elements associated with this, the entire metadata elements associated with this digital object, I have access to the structural metadata, the administrative metadata, and the descriptive metadata, right? So uh, administrative metadata, right? I guess maybe the language here could be also administrative metadata, right? We know that this is authored in English or something. It could also be maybe descriptive, depending on how you, you want to look, <coughs> you know, look at this. Um, yeah, so, so again, uh, administrative metadata is normally linked to things uh, associated with how you're going to manage the resource, how about that, manage the resource, uh, things to do with uh, licensing, right? Long-term preservation. All right. Uh, so, uh, I guess the question, the obvious question is, uh, then how do we, how do we create metadata? Then uh, it turns out, by the way, that uh, this issue of metadata is a serious one. Um, I'm working with some really smart students that are interested in this area, and I'll talk about some of the things we are doing so far as metadata is concerned. I think either Saturday or Sunday. Uh, but it turns out that. Um, there are certain guidelines that you can use to ensure that you, you are doing the right thing. Uh, the very first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that you use an appropriate metadata scheme to encode metadata about your digital objects. Now, there's a whole slew of metadata scheme, Dublin Core. We have a discussion about Dublin Core, but there's law, you know, any object metadata. I'm sure most of you are uh, familiar with Mark, for instance. Um, there are things like ETD, MS. Uh, so you want to make sure that you decide or come up with the appropriate scheme that you're going to use. Uh, you also want to make sure that you're using controlled vocabulary sets to avoid errors, right? I don't know if it's an example of you know, controlled vocabulary sets. This is a big one here. Uh, to, to help showcase that uh, this is important, I'll go to the UNSA repository, right? And I do apologize for waffling around, but I'm trying to ensure that what I'm talking about makes sense. When a user is browsing content in a digital library, like an institutional repository, one of the ways they will browse, browse for content is, if I'm from engineering, I'll use subjects, right? I'll scroll down here and I'll ask myself, what sort of, and there are no subjects here, what sort of subjects can I use? Do I want, right? Now this is the entire repository, but if I go to, let's say, um, School of Education, POW, you notice that the field associated with subjects changes, right? Observe. Now these things, it's recommended that you use a controlled vocabulary set for you to do this. Why? Because you would limit the likelihood or you would actually literally avoid the likelihood of people making errors. Typographical errors. Errors associated with uh, not tagging these objects with the correct subjects, for instance. And we've actually seen this. Last year, I worked with a group of students that uh, did the superficial analysis that's associated with this. I'll, I'll navigate to that because this is extremely important. In case I forget, I'll navigate to uh, a example, uh, to an example, I don't know if it's resource here, but maybe it's data, I suppose, I don't know if it's data. I'll go to probably resource. I'll, I'll go to the, the, uh, although this, the, the actual writing of the thing was not that good, but at some part in this document, the report that they generated, they did this analysis, right? If you look at their superficial analysis, this is just an example, one of many problems with the repository. You notice that they found that uh, these are the tags, right? Unique tags associated with the different objects. What you immediately see here is that, um, if you have uh, a keen eye, what you immediately see is that there are things that don't make sense here, right? Uh, look at classic example would be, da, 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 da. let's see if I can find, perhaps this is, this. there we go, look at this. They found that you have instances where you have this. There are two subjects here, breastfeeding with a dot and breastfeeding without a dot. In an ideal case, it's supposed to be one heading. Right? Other problems with this really is that you can literally tell by looking at this that they're not using a controlled, uh, controlled, um, no controlled uh, vocabulary is being used here. 
right? And really what the, these, these students were working towards is to, to, to figure out if um, we could actually assess the effectiveness of subject controlled vocabulary sets, right? So controlled, controlled vocabulary sets are specific different subjects. If you look at a place like UNSA, UNSA has uh, people that do research in education, engineering, natural sciences. If you go in education, there are sub fields, adult education, library and information science, right? Sciences or STEM. These are all different entities that use different controlled vocabulary sets. So what we're working towards is trying to see if we could, uh, we could actually identify, uh, or they could actually identify uh, a way of, um, of, of, of integrating controlled vocabulary sets to the repository. But that's neither here nor there. The key thing here is that one of the things you have to think about is uh, inter incorporating controlled vocabulary sets. And there are really people that have written extensively about the importance of using controlled vocabulary sets. Um, there's a publication that uh, was authored last year. Um, I'll talk about this, I think, on Sunday or Saturday. Uh, but this is one of the problems we identified, right? Problems with the UNSA repository. Something else we want to do is you want to ensure as much as possible that you're using recognized standards, ISO standards. So don't just randomly say we're going to use, the date we're going to use is, uh, or a date, we'll, we'll be writing our date, like if, if we're ingesting it, uh, an object right now will say, we'll use Ma July, a date like July 9, 2020, or AUL 2020. Use a recognized ISO standard, right? Um, and you can easily uh, figure out what these ISO standards are by just looking up the standards. You can see them actually by going to Fumi Data Records. If you come here, look at this the presentation of this date. These are ISO standards, right? If they represent a year in, like this, um, or timestamp is represented by like this, right? So ISO standards, very important. It's not just dates. ISO standards will <clears throat> help you specify that, and I'm waffling around here, let me go to, they'll tell you exactly how the language should be specified. You just don't type the language as English, right? You use this ISO standard, EN means it's English. Right, um, so some some few guidelines. I think there should be links in, in the resources that have been provided in the module that uh, speak more about uh, what sort of other ISO standards you should think about. These are just uh, guidelines you should think about. Right? It turns out though that um, there are a number of metadata schemes out there. Uh, seeing as you're an expert, one of your tasks would be to identify the metadata scheme that you need to use, right? Um, but of course, like most things, uh, the many metadata schemes that are available out there are domain specific. So some of them are generic, some of them are dependent or specific to the type of object that you want to store in this digital library. Uh, so if you're wanting to work with learning object, learning objects, for instance, teaching and learning material, you're better off using LOM, right? Learning object metadata. If you are going to set up a digital library that is going to be used to house electronic pieces and dissertations, use a metadata scheme called ETDMS, right? If you're you are coming up with a digital library that is going to be some generic repository, institutional repository like the UNSA repository, use a generic metadata scheme like Dublin Core, right? So uh, a ton of metadata schemes out there, but key thing here is one of the things you have to do is ensure that you identify the appropriate metadata scheme. Now this year I'm working with a group of students that are interested in setting up a learning object repository and part of their task is to go out there and, and do some superficial, um, I guess, um, literature synthesis to arrive at the appropriate metadata scheme that they will incorporate with this learning object repository. And one of the, one of the metadata schemes they'll probably have to look at is LOM, obviously. Right? This is an IEEE standard, by the way. Uh, but uh, it turns out that uh, we normally use Dublin Core as a case study for 5310 because it's the most widely used metadata scheme. It's found all over the place in, in uh, web pages, uh, in repositories, right? So by default, if you, ask, if you look at your, your typical repository, this is Dublin Core, by the way. This DC just simply means Dublin Core. Uh, and it's not just this space, so Omega does the same thing. 
uh, ePrints does the same thing. So if we go to an ePrints repository, for instance, pub.ucs.ucp.ac.za, uh, if we go to an ePrint repository, and we, I hope there's a way of accessing metadata from here. By default, I do believe, unless the things have changed the most recent uh, ePrints repository, by default, and I wonder if my lab has done a lot here. By default, this content is represented in a certain way. Dublin call, right? Dublin call. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so many different metadata schemes. Um, your task would be to decide on which one is the most appropriate one. So some examples on how these metadata schemes kind of look like, and I was getting I was getting these examples from um, from the I think this is coming from is it the UCT repository because it turns out that when you're extracting metadata using machine to machine interaction like the OIPMH protocol for instance you can specify which metadata scheme you want to use to extract the metadata right so classic example of um, Dublin core here if you can see DC here right um, and you can see the the tags here this is Dublin core so something else I want to draw attention to as well looking at just these three examples here is that um, this presentation I deliberately did this because Lo and behold, this is a classic example of, I don't know if people remember the discussion you had with Dr. Piri, the discussion associated with um, so-called, uh, I don't know if people remember the discussion that you had about markup languages. HTML is just one of many markup languages. There's LaTeX, there's Markdown, there's XML. Now this is what you're seeing here is, uh, if you remember, this is XML, right? This is a tag. The content is in between these tags, right? If you look at this tag, the tag names here, DC here is a signal that this is double code. An example of a different type of metadata element here, this is ETDMS, right? You can see from the top here. Um, uh, something that perhaps people are used to, this is Mac now. I don't have extensive experience working with Mac, but I, use the, I, I decided to include this because I'd like to think you guys are more experienced and you can literally see that, oh, so it's possible for you to crosswalk from Dublin call to the equivalent of this, this is Dublin call, the equivalent of Dublin call converted into Mac is like this. Right, so same thing really, but it's just um, presenting the content. Remember the content is in between these tags, presenting the content using different metadata schemes. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to pause for a little while to see if people have specific questions before we we uh, drill down and look at the so-called Dublin Core metadata scheme. Is is, is this making sense? Uh, or are we talking about? Uh, oh. Sorry, uh, I didn't notice this comment saying you are, oh, if I said you're off, you're off doc. I don't know what this means, I, I, but this was minutes ago. I don't know what Judith was trying to say here. Okay, so I'm trying to see if, uh, do, do, we, do we have experience with, besides I know that uh, I, th I think there's a course that we do. Um, I don't know which, which uh, it, at undergrad, if you did your, your program at UNSA, where you get to look at things like Mark or something, uh, right? Classification schemes like IDF or something. Did, did you look at, are you familiar with Dublin Core or these other things I'm talking about like LOM or um, ETDMS? Are there any other specific metadata elements that you perhaps use that way? Yeah, uh, Doc. Yes. Let, yes. Let you... Yes, we, we, are, we are using a Mac as a metadata schema. For, 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 for representing which type of content, what type of digital objects do you use Mac for? Or which um, application? Now, these are important questions. So the application, for what type of objects? Well, like uh, when we are... Um, 
doing uh, when we are cataloging. Uh, we are using when we are cataloging uh, information sources like uh, books, yeah, and the yeah. uh, journals. Yeah, we use Mac. Yeah, no, no, there's, there's, no, no. yeah there's, there's, a, there's a couple of interesting things here. You notice that in certain instances, the, the type of encoding that you use um, could be based on what sort of policy you have in place as an organization or as a, as a unit in that organization. But also, it could be tied to the type of application that you use. Right now, I don't have excessive experience with OCA, uh, I mean, Koha and OPAC and all these different things, but but I would like to think that Koha is, I know that Koha is versatile enough to allow you to actually extract content in Dublin Core, by the way, because Koha is implemented using the OIPMH protocol, right? So anything that is implemented using the OIPMH protocol will allow you to do this, observe. If I go to, as people are thinking about these questions, if I, if I go to, sorry about that, if I go to a sample record in the dispatch repository here, and I decide to say I want to access, let's look at this. I want to access this record here. If you look at this record, by default it's presented, not by default actually, it's being represented using Dublin Core here, DC, right? But what the OIF PMH protocol does, it allows you to use a certain verb. You have access to a verb called uh, list meta metadata formats, right? This verb will tell you the different types of metadata schemes you can use to extract data from the repository, right? UK ETDDC, QDC, DIDL, MODS, ORE, METS, OIDC, which is a default, RDF. Now, I know people in here are uh, very familiar with RDF because I know Abel shares something similar. Um, I don't know if it's third year or fourth year. Mark, right? Uh, XOAI, DIM, ETDMS, right? So, so the key thing here is what, what you want to think about is um, at work, it's probably that uh, the type of encoding or scheme you use is application specific. In certain instances, you might not know this, but there was probably a deliberate policy that someone created, maybe before you joined, to say, this is a scheme we're going to use. In certain instances, you implicitly adopt the policy because you read somewhere that a lot of people use Mac, for instance. It doesn't necessarily mean that you should exclusively use Mac, right? There are other schemes that you can use out there. Are there any other thoughts of uh, other schemes that you use at work besides Mac? Any other, besides uh, the Unza library here, any other experiences with metadata schemes? Uh, anyone has experience with Dublin Core or this is, because it's going to be a case study. I'm trying to gauge how quickly we should proceed with Dublin Core, or maybe we should spend a bit of time there. Do we all have experience with Dublin Core? Or who, uh, is there anyone who doesn't have experience with Dublin Core? Or anyone who, hasn't, who, does, who has never used Dublin Core? Let me see. Uh. Doc. Yes. Yes. Um. See. Oofed. Okay. In my case, I've been just hearing about it. Okay. Uh, not really using it. Yeah. So, if it be possible, I would request that uh, you take a little bit of time to uh, really explain on the how, what's supposed to be done and like. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. Here's, the, here's the thing, right? The, the thing, the, the, and, and I don't know if we're picking up on what's happening here. This course, the way that it was designed, right, is you notice that uh, a number of building blocks that are leading up to our discussion right now. So this discussion that we're about to start about, or that we've already started, about metadata. This is marker. These are marker languages, and usually the encoding of metadata is, used, is done using XML. In, in respect of what sort of metadata you're using, all you're doing is you're encoding what? Content within tags. This is the content you're interested in. These tags here will specify what sort of scheme you're using in this case. Right? So, so I'll come here and I'll change this to mark, for instance, and hopefully you should be able to work. Notice that if I access a sample metadata record, it changes. There's no DC now. I have this data field tag 042. And I know the experts in the room know what now. I'm, I'm ignorant myself. I don't know what this 
720 is all about. I'm not really taking a keen interest in much, but perhaps I should. Uh, but these codes here mean something, right? But all you're doing here is you're playing around with markup. Right? So whether it's HTML, if you're playing around with HTML, this markup will take, will manifest itself differently, right? Uh, so if you go to the UNSA website, for instance, and you say view source, for instance, you notice that this markup, right? If I copy this, or copy out the HTML, this markup presents itself differently, right? But in all these different instances, you are just using what? Tags. To embed what content within the tags? That's all. And this is I mean, HTML, XML, XHTML, Markdown. It's the same thing, right? And uh, um, it's, just, it's just different ways of encoding content, right? But anyways, uh, the key takeaway point here is uh, as an expert, you would need to identify which scheme. For the purposes of our discussion, would have loved to maybe focus on EDMS or perhaps uh, uh, perhaps uh, LOM, uh, but because Dublin Core will manifest itself again once we maybe have the practical session, uh, and or once we start looking at this interoperability protocol, we normally use Dublin Core, right? Okay, I'm looking at the time here. I we should uh, have enough time. I'm sure we can. I'm wondering if we sh I don't know if I'm reaching here. Any thoughts on whether we can continue our discussion of Dublin Core? I'll give you a sense of Dublin Core here. This is page 98. Dublin Core persists all the way up to 98 until. Until 127 here. So, but 29 slides. Um, I don't know what people thought. I'm looking at the time. I think we can stretch this further. Um, we don't necessarily have to rush these things. I, I also would prefer it if people have a chance to digest some of these things that we're talking about, I think, instead of rushing. So, two things. Number one, we can either uh, start our discussion of Dublin Core, or we can continue this discussion of Dublin Core tomorrow, and then start our discussion of interoperability protocols. I don't know what people's thoughts are. I'm looking at the time, and whether people are tired or think this is too much or something. I think we still have a bit of time. Uh, we, I know we have a bit of time because we've deliberately scheduled the, the talks by these people to be done on days where we're not meeting. So you notice that uh, Boomba is coming through on Monday, for instance, because we don't have interaction on Monday. Uh, so, any any tech, we can we start our discussion of Dublin Core. We can continue tomorrow, so that people digest um, what we've just started about metadata. You look it up a little bit more about structural metadata and descriptive metadata and you know administrative metadata. Uh, thoughts. Oh, it was a question. I'm trying to find out what people prefer. I don't know. Okay, so Matilda suggested that we continue tomorrow. Doc, I'm equally suggesting that tomorrow be better. Yeah, no rush. I, was, I, was, uh, I, I got a call from, I don't know if people are familiar with the Kosmui, and I know that Kandiva hasn't really mentioned this to me, but I'm told that the exams for the masters especially MNIST, are likely going to be in October, not August, right? So, but, but this is tentative. Dr. Kandra is yet to confirm. And so I sat there and I was thinking, if that's the case, then at least we have, I guess, a little bit of time to quickly go through these things and then in the process try and see if we can, again, uh, try and find time to revisit some of these things so that we understand. Um, so yeah, we will continue tomorrow, but I'm just throwing these ideas out there so that we we can we can already start thinking about them. Um, I have a hidden agenda in, in my case. I mean, there there there's other vested interests here besides just doing this. My hope is that some of you, right, you you work for organizations where you will be expected or you're expected to do some of the things that we're talking about here. So it would be nice if you could implement something. Um, 
in the past, like last year's uh, group, we had two people from Zikas and after our discussion in this course, they went out there and they set up the Zikas repository, which by the way, is accessible. Uh, uh, Zikas, this space with Zikas, this space with Zikas. Dot, uh, .sc .zm or .edu .zm. I think it's still online. Yeah, there we go. Oh, I have a good memory here. Oh, it's under maintenance. But once they're done, you'll be able to access it from, from there. So I'm hoping that maybe some people here, now I know some of you uh, perhaps have already implemented this at, at work, right? But perhaps you don't have an explicit policy to do with metadata. And it's not just you. Adrian might not be aware of this, but I've, I've, I've been talking to the people that uh, handle the institutional repository, the likes of Mr. Zuru, for instance, and I know he's just, um, he swapped roles here, but, but there's no deliberate policy that specifies exactly how ETD metadata should be encoded. You're supposed to use ETDMS. There are guidelines, right? The NDLTD has come up with NDLTD. Org. They've come up with guidelines on how metadata elements for ETDs should be encoded. You use ETDMS. Um, so these are things to think about. In as much as you might have implemented the repository at work, but now would be the time to perfect all these different things. Right? And you'll soon see why all these are, are important things to think about once we discuss so-called downstream services and interoperability protocols. But um, I'll leave it uh, at that, unless if people have thoughts that they want to share before we part ways. Uh, anything that you want us to maybe quickly talk about, on, on, or maybe it was clear, there's no gray areas that you want me to emphasize more on or something. I don't know. I'm curious what, what uh, uh, Judith meant here by saying you're off, right? I don't know what... Uh... Uh, I was not getting you, Doc. Oh, okay. I'm glad. Now, I, I, have, uh, I don't know if it's a character flaw, a mental problem, but sometimes uh, when I don't structure my, my conversations, I'll start talking about, and I think it happens to most human beings, I'll, I'll start talking about things that are, they might be vaguely related to the subject matter, but I guess it's my role trying to emphasize a point and so I thought that's what had happened where you know we are so talking about metadata but we are veering off and looking at repositories and this is what I thought okay fine okay okay so if there are no questions then I'll see you tomorrow uh same time uh, we'll continue the discussion with Dublin Core I will share this recording in case you want to play it back or play back some portions of the recording before we meet tomorrow. Uh, thank you and good night. Thanks. Good night too.